It's January 31st. That means it's time for a new 31 on 31. Today, we're going to stop and rank the big three. All of the movies from Tarantino, Fincher, and Nolan in one epic ranking. Let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Let me know your ranking of all 31 movies from the big three, Nolan, Tarantino, and Fincher. My list is not the right list. It's just my list, and I would love to see yours. I have spoken. 31 on 31 is a series from the Autop stream, and they graciously invited me to join them once again for this epic ranking down below in the description as well as the pinned comment i'll have links to all of the other participants in this 31 on 31 with that said let's get started coming in in last place is alien 3 speaking of great films this is not one of them if you're familiar with my channel you know that this is my least favorite movie of all all time. Of course, Sigourney Weaver is great, and you can see hints of David Fincher's talent here, but this is a bleak, brutal audience and a bit of a mess when it comes to the story. There were massive reshoots. They started filming without a completed script. They kicked David Fincher out of the process once production was done. Not a great plan. But none of that is why this is my least favorite movie. It's because the first 10 minutes contain some of the worst audience betrayal I've ever seen in a big blockbuster. They totally undo the victory of the previous film, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, in a a way that doesn't feel earned. It feels like the audience gets cheated out of what we felt at the end of the movie Aliens and for no reason that makes any sense. And so this is my least favorite film of all time. Bringing us into the top 30 is Death Proof. Now this is kind of a fun experiment, but not a particularly enjoyable film. There's enough plot here for about 45 minutes and the rest is padded out with Tarantino dialogue and that works for all of his other movies but with this movie it's intentionally trying to mimic the style of Grindhouse films hence why it was in the movie Grindhouse and those aren't known for their intricate and interesting characters or their witty banter between the characters therefore it just feels hollow in this context. Adding to that, there's one quick death kill 45 minutes into it, and then there is a long chase at the end, but that's not nearly enough car grindhouse action for a movie with this runtime. So this is one that it's kind of fun that it exists, but it's not one that I ever really want to rewatch. Fun fact, though, the gas station prominently featured in this movie is about a mile away from the high school that I attended. Here I am. In fact, that road that you can kind of see right there, if you just drive down that road for about a mile, you end up at my high school. So that scene is a lot of fun for me to watch, but it has nothing to do with the movie itself. It's just where I grew up. Number 29, Mank. Now, I know this one might be a little bit of an unpopular opinion. But I just did not get into this movie whatsoever. Now, I respect the talent that went into it. Fincher was immaculate in recreating the style of a type of movie that came out 80 years ago. The banter, the dialogue feels like it's out of those movies and delivered perfectly. But at the same time, it's a movie that I just never connected with it on any sort of meaningful level. It also felt so soaked in Hollywood of that time that I just felt like I was always behind in trying to play catch up on a story that wasn't really all that complicated. I just couldn't follow the moving pieces because I didn't know who people were. And therefore, the movie feels a little bit like a fantastic cover song by a great band but it's of a song that I wouldn't be listening to anyway. So it's a movie that I can respect without really enjoying. As a point of reference, every other movie on this list, I would safely give a thumbs up. The previous two on here, I respect Tarantino and Fincher's ability to mimic the styles of movies that they were going for, but I can't say that they're ones that I fully enjoy or would look to rewatch 
The rest of these are just movies that I enjoy. Next up, The Game, an intriguing thriller about a man wrapped up in a game that causes him to lose control of his life. From beginning almost all the way to the end, there's this mystery that kind of keeps you captivated, and it does a great job of just putting all these little hints, teases out there, putting evidence in each direction that makes you think you're starting to figure out what exactly is going on, and it's engaging from beginning to end, and it's all really well done, but I think one's ability to enjoy this film is tied directly to one's ability to suspend disbelief because as it does its big final reveal, every time I see it, I'm like, nah, I don't think that works. Oh, that didn't work. It, when you just stop and think about everything that took place in light of this ending, it just strains way too much credibility. And honestly, for me, it significantly knocks the movie back because it's a solid thriller that is built entirely around the payoff of the end, and the end payoff doesn't pay off. Coming in at number 27 is The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I watched this for the very first time just a couple of months back, and I don't know if this has been a common comparison, but to me, this felt a little bit like a fincherized version of Forrest Gump. It's kind of this epic, sprawling tale of this person's life as they go through all these different kind of phases and things with some sort of gimmick tied to each of them. This one being a guy that is born old and ages in reverse. And at times, it can have some really potent, big emotions to it. The whole thing is just such an interesting idea that it kind of kept me thinking about what was happening. But there's also a lot of stuff in it that's just kind of weird and awkward in a way that didn't sit quite right with me, especially when you're very early in the film and he's a, still very young and has interest in like a five-year-old girl because he's like five. Wow, that was weird. It's just kind of weird the way some of it plays out and builds into later in the film. And then the final choice that the character makes in, in about the child, um, it's not one that I can get on board with. So it makes it difficult for me to fully root for the character in light of some of that stuff. So a lot of stuff in here that's really good. A lot of stuff in here that's really weird and kind of holds it back for me. Then we have The Dark Knight Rises. Now, this is a movie that I've always enjoyed, but every time I've watched it, I've liked it a little bit less, and I've always found it to be the weakest of the Dark Knight trilogy. You know, on the positive side, when it has its big, powerful moments, some of them are just as good as the stuff in the previous two films. But I feel like they kind of wrote themselves into a bit of a difficult corner with where the Dark Knight ended and Nolan didn't fully know how to get out of it while trying to top what he'd done with the Dark Knight. And so it leads to a story that has few too many plot contrivances and conveniences and a bunch of the stuff that Nolan's been known for avoiding in his previous films. I feel it's too on display here. There's many videos pointing out gigantic plot holes in this film. And then even when it comes to the action, some of it just feels way too clunky for me. So it's a movie that, I don't know, it just feels off. There's a bunch of really good stuff, but something also about it just doesn't come together fully for me. Number 25, The Hateful Eight. This movie felt to me a little bit like Nolan returning to what he did with Reservoir Dogs, except it's a Western. It plays a bit kind of like a play with this mystery to it where you're trying to figure out what's going on, this kind of slow build of tension that gets better and better as it goes along while building up to this big, gigantic showdown. For me, it's about an hour too long. It feels like it should have been about the runtime of Reservoir Dogs. Instead, it's like three hours long, and apparently there's an extended cut on Netflix that's like four hours long or something like that. I just don't know that there was enough story here to justify that slow of a pacing. Coming in at number 24 is Tenet, Christopher Nolan's latest film that they hoped would save the theaters and that didn't quite happen. And for me, actually disappointed me a good bit. I went into this one with inception level of expectations, and it didn't quite live up to, to that level. Now, there is some very cool ideas in here. I love that Nolan always comes in with these bonkers, crazy cool ideas and explores them. Problem here is the movie's just too confusing, too difficult to follow, 
and for the wrong reasons. Like, I get that I'm going to be confused when time starts going backwards, but I was even having trouble following parts of it before that when we were just kind of globe hop trotting because it was just jumping from plot point to plot point as go talk to this person to get the information, find the next person you need to find to look at this art painting so you can talk to this person over here. And it moved so quick that I always felt like I was two steps behind what was happening. And then time started moving backwards. And when we got to that finale... I didn't know what was going on, so I watched a bunch of videos explaining what was going on, watched it a second time, and I still didn't fully know what was going on, but it looked really cool. Next up, following Christopher Nolan's ultra-low budget debut film that is really quite an impressive achievement for what he was able to do with virtually no money, shooting in his free time with his friends. This guy's really good. It has so many of the trademarks of what Nolan would be known for. It's packed with interesting ideas. It builds towards a twist at the end that causes you to reevaluate everything that you saw before. It's also a very low budget film. It's not the most rewatchable film on this list. And there are some points that because of the low budget and the black and white, the audio is not the best, at least of the version that I watched. And some can be, things can be a bit tough to follow. But the fact that Nolan could make this film for like $8,000 is truly remarkable. Coming in at number 22 is Jackie Brown, Quentin Tarantino's first and only film that's an adaptation of a previously existing story. As always, the cast is great. The central story about Jackie trying to outmaneuver all these people is quite a bit of fun. I always struggle a little bit with this one because it feels like Elmore Leonard's Cleverness is in competition with Quentin Tarantino's cleverness. Elmore Leonard writes these stories that are kind of tightly woven, building towards some specific moment. Quentin Tarantino is known for kind of long scenes with these flashy dialogue. And I just don't know that kind of that hangout vibe fits well with this particular story. I don't know if it's the best pairing. It's still a lot of fun. It's a nice novelty in the middle of Quentin Tarantino's filmography. I think Quentin Tarantino is best when he's just doing his own thing. 21 is The Prestige, Christopher Nolan's tale about two competing magicians and their rivalry between the two of them causes them to escalate their antics and trying to defeat the other one and eventually it moves into the deadly category. This is one that it works best as kind of this exploration of how dangerous rivalries can be and how the pursuit of being the best can have dire consequences for some of the people involved. There's a lot of cleverness in the way the story is told and structured where Nolan took the way a magic trick is done or illusion is done and uses that as the structure for his movie, all building up to a big gigantic twist that blew a bunch of your minds. I've never been as wowed by this movie as a lot of other people. It's very well done. It's just tough for me to fully root for two characters that are behaving so badly and never second guessing their horrible behavior towards one another and the people around them that they love so much. And so I, I, I dig a lot of stuff about it, but I'm not fully in love with it. Bringing us into the top 20 is Panic Room. This is a great example of how a world-class director can take a fairly generic concept and just elevate everything. On paper, this feels like so many other generic, forgettable thrillers that have been made, but it does everything right in the execution, so it is really effective. It finds a way to keep the story moving forward while it's all about this lady being stuck in a panic room. Finds all the right conflicts, but it doesn't linger too long in any of them. It finds a way to, inside of the kind of the villain crew, give you sympathy for some of them. Some of them are more villainous, and it Every little thrill that it can squeeze out of this concept that we've kind of seen done before, it squeezes it out of the movie. So this might not be the most ambitious film on the list. It might not be the biggest film on the list but it delivers the thrills that it's supposed to. At number 19, Insomnia. Christopher Nolan's third film and his first 
big studio film is the least Christopher Nolan of all of Christopher Nolan films, as it's a remake of another film. It was basically him proving to the studio that he can handle a big project and big movie stars and still deliver a solid film. And he absolutely does that with this movie. A big part of what makes this movie work, you get two phenomenal performances, one from Al Pacino and one from Robin Williams and kind of this cat and mouse game. And what it What it does really nicely is create a scenario where we have a very fallen, broken and flawed lead character who's been compromised and he's trying to catch someone that knows that he's compromised. And it just kind of creates this level of intrigue with the characters that takes kind of a familiar killer type story and elevates it to that next level. Then we have the girl with the dragon tattoo, a complex story with multifaceted characters and a bunch of rabbit trails that you actually want to go down. It sets up a mystery that you're interested in and then gives these characters with these big stories and ties to all these other things that just make the world of this story feel really big. All along the way, there's plenty of twists and turns that are all unexpected. At the same time, it feels like it's trying to take this big, massive book and squeeze it into the runtime of a movie. So there's a little bit too much in here. It goes on a bit too long and certainly there's far too many endings, but that's the problem when you're trying to adapt books into a movie. Something gets lost in the process. You can certainly feel this movie competing with its desire to put more of the book in there than you're able to do with a movie. But man, it delivers a bunch of really cool stuff, especially one of the most memorable opening credit sequences of the last 15 years. Number 17, Interstellar, Christopher Nolan's space film and his version of 2001, A Space Odyssey. In certain ways, it's Christopher Nolan's most emotional and personal film where you have these sequences where you see this father broken up over the consequences of the mission that he is on. There are some phenomenally directed sequences where the music and the thrills of the sequence with a ship trying to line up with another ship. Really incredible, incredible stuff. I love the model work inside of it and the look of so much of it. it you just you just buy it. None of it looks like special or visual effects. Third act twist. I, I don't know that it fully lands, fully works for me. We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. But it also doesn't alienate me. It doesn't put me off to the film. I just kind of have, I'm right in the middle. I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't think you fully did it. But I don't mind that you did it either. I'm kind of in an odd spot with that one. So it's it's a movie that tries to aim higher than I think it actually hits, but it still hits a good place for me. At number 16, Reservoir Dogs. Quentin Tarantino's debut film immediately has so many of his trademarks, from the snappy, quick dialogue to the memorable characters that pop to the fact that it has long scenes that are dialogue based you he had fully kind of fleshed out his form in his very first movie it functions as a little bit of a who done it and plays out somewhat like a play because we're just in this one location and only have these flashbacks to these other spots and it just makes for interesting way to tell a story it's all about a robbery that we don't ever see on screen we're trying to piece together what did happen and all of it is told through this lens of quentin tarantino where he's such a film lover and so much of it is an homage to these films that he's loved so it feels familiar while being so fresh and new at the same time up next is kill bill tarantino's take on martial arts films action revenge and modern day westerns it is jam-packed with some phenomenal action that feels true to the types of movies that it's homaging while at the same time having that distinct Tarantino vibe to it. It's over the top, it's crazy, it's wild, it's epic. I'm not sure it needed to be two movies lengths long. I'm not quite sure it has that much story to warrant this epic of a runtime. And it's told 
kind of out of order. And I'm not sure that they, he picked the most effective order to communicate this particular story. So it's one of those ones that I almost wonder if it would benefit greatly from some sort of re-edit of it that takes it from four hours down to like two and a half hours and maybe move some pieces around. I'd kind of like to see that. And number 14, Zodiac, a sprawling story about the real investigation of the Zodiac killer that takes place over decades as they spent decades trying to track down this guy and they never figured it out. It explores a bunch of really interesting stuff about how there's a lot of complications inside of police systems that make it difficult for them to even do their jobs. Likewise, there's explorations about the dangers of obsessions and what it can do to an individual. All of it done with kind of world-class David Fincher storytelling. I thought the second half was a lot more effective than the first half. The first half felt a bit too much like it was trying to hit all of these real life events that happened. So it was kind of like montaging through milestones of the investigation. Whereas the second half, you felt like you connected to Jake Gyllenhaal's character and had a little bit more of a smoother journey with him. All in all, a really solid exploration of this real life investigation. Coming in at number 13 is Django Unchained. If Kill Bill was his take on martial arts films. This was him diving into spaghetti westerns and having a lot of fun with his revenge fantasy. As you go into it, so much of it works because there's a set of great characters. Christoph Waltz is, is such a character so interesting in his complicated way that he perceives the world around him. Django is such a cool character. Leonardo DiCaprio is so despicable as well as memeable inside of this film. And Samuel L. Jackson, sometimes you forget he's a world-class actor because we know of him as the persona and he kind of can play that same cool guy in a lot of movies. But then he does stuff like this where he disappears into a character and this guy is just despicable. Put it all together and you get a movie with great action, great characters, and once again, amazing film from Quentin Tarantino. Then we have Gone Girl, an engaging thriller and mystery that keeps presenting us with information and then as soon as we get more information we reinterpret everything that we've known up to that point in time it's filled with snappy dialogue that doesn't feel like it was scripted it feels organic like people talking and joking with one another and it has one of the absolute best uses of an unreliable narrator that that i can think of where it puts a plot device in there that makes it think like it's giving us a different perspective on what happened early on in their relationship, only for us to realize that it wasn't, it was meant to dupe the characters in the movie as well as dupe the audience. And the movie's big plot twist is in the middle of the film, but it manages to not lose momentum in the second half. You're still engaged in wondering how all of this will be resolved. Maybe the final 10 minutes are a little bit rushed and it doesn't land as smoothly as maybe you'd hoped, but it is a fun journey to be on. Number 11, Fight Club. Now this movie came out right before I turned 18 and it was basically the rally cry of every angsty, disenfranchised person my age when it came out. We'd constantly get together to watch this film. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. And it, it does a pretty remarkable job of capturing this generation of dudes that feel directionless and exploring the damage that comes from it. It certainly doesn't celebrate the anarchy that unfolds in the second half of the film, but it also doesn't fully blame them for being misled and finding their way down this path. It's making an observation about problems inside of society of what happens when dudes don't have any direction. Add to it, you just see David Fincher's style 
all over this movie. Now, I can't say that this is a movie that fully resonates with me now as much as it did back then, but that doesn't change the fact that they really captured something, an energy, a frustration, and angst with this film. Bringing us into the top 10 is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This movie didn't sit well with some Tarantino fans as it's kind of meanders around, and it's not really a story-based film. It's a hangout film set in Hollywood in the 1960s, and so your enjoyment of this film kind of depends on how much you enjoy spending time with these characters in this setting, as well as how much you're able to accept Quentin Tarantino's fantasy that takes place in the final act of the film. As for me, I enjoyed these characters, I enjoyed this setting, and I loved the fantasy of the final act of this film as the movie's designed in a way that while it's not really plot-based, it puts these little threads and these little things that are hinted at all throughout the whole movie, and then they all converge in this final showdown that takes place, and... I just had a grin on my face ear to ear as all of that was going down and you saw how these little things that happen suddenly have big implications all while being inside of Quentin Tarantino's alternative version of history. So I really dug this film. Next up, Dunkirk, Christopher Nolan's take on a war movie and in typical fashion, he does it in a way that we haven't really seen before. The story is told from three different perspectives and those three perspectives are at three different time periods all moving towards the final section, the final moments of the film. And I thought that that was just such an interesting way to tell a story about an event and have this constant sense of building tension towards the final showdown. It's not designed to be a big character movie. It's designed to be this experiential film that's visceral, that puts you on the beaches, it puts you in a plane, and it puts you on a boat as just an average person trying to go and save the day, all of it building up to kind of the final section of it that for me, I thought really paid off and had some emotional impact to it. In particular, I love the section on the boat with just this good man trying to do the right thing. Everything he said sounds so profound. And for really honestly, his section is probably a lot of what elevates the movie for me. At number eight is Batman Begins. Batman is one of my top two favorite superheroes of all time. Christopher Nolan is one of my favorite directors of all time. And I love origin stories. So like this is a movie designed for me personally. It's told with Nolan's kind of trademark, non-linear fashion. It decides to focus in on Bruce Wayne and his journey and what would drive someone to do something like this. And it just makes for some very compelling stuff for the first hour and 15 minutes as he is truly becoming Batman throughout the film. It loses a little bit of steam when you get to the... Uh, the docks sequence and he captures Falcone. The whole movie's kind of been building for him to do that. And once it happens, the movie has to reshuffle a little bit to kind of set up our third act and our big showdown and reintroduce who our real main villain is. And so it does lose a little bit as it goes along. But in general, this is my kind of movie. At number seven, Inglorious Bastards, Quentin Tarantino's World War II film that's a bit more of a spy espionage film and as always told with amazing dialogue, flashy characters, and with his unique alternative view of history. It's told and written in a way that it feels a little bit like a novel. It's broken up into chapters. Each sequence that is a chapter is very long, stretched out. The scenes play out for a while. But while they're, It's jam-packed with these tension-building scenes where you just feel the tension building towards the big climax of the sequence before we move on to the next section. And the movie as a whole builds towards a big, gigantic, insanely satisfying, Quentin Tarantino-esque, insane, alternate history ending that is 
such a joy while showing just how a masterful storyteller he is. Then we have Seven, a film that sounds like 1,000 other serial killer films about the experienced veteran that wants to retire who's teamed up with the new cocky hotshot to solve a case. Have you ever seen anything like this? No. But once again, in the hands of David Fincher, Everything about it is just raised to the next level. It's an immaculately scripted film that's crafted perfectly, building up to the satisfying conclusion. It explores all these sorts of ideas about criminal justice and how dark the world can really be and the toll that it takes on the people that have to live in the worst elements of society, all of it building towards one of the great depressing endings of all time. Put the gun down. I saw you with the box. What was in the box? That is the logical conclusion of the movie and the story they'd been telling and the themes that had been established. So once again, a movie that is elevated because of David Fincher's incredible ability to pull all the everything great out of a story. In fifth place is The Social Network, a fantastic pairing of a sharp, crisp Aaron Sorkin script with the amazing talents of David Fincher, all while telling a story that's really interesting. And especially you think about it, that this movie came out over 10 years ago and it feels just as relevant today as it did back then. And that when this movie came out, Mark Zuckerberg wasn't even 30 years old yet. But all throughout it, it just tells this fascinating story about this insecure character and the choices that he makes from beginning to end just to try and feel like he fits in and feel like he's not excluded, all while being about a website about making friends and connections with people it finds a way to take what could be a really boring story about um, ownership litigation and turns it into a compelling character study. And so this is one that I, every time I watch it, I just love, love, love what Sorkin did with that script and how Fincher executed it. In fourth place is Memento, a brilliant concept for a film executed perfectly. It finds a way to kind of take this simple story about a man trying to track down the person that murdered his wife and turn it into something so much more and one of the most mind-blowing cinematic experiences that I've ever had. Even re-watching it, I'm just amazed at the skill and wit that went into the entire process of the film. It uses a series of these reverse cliffhangers where you see some piece of information, but then the story cuts backwards. And so you're waiting to see what led to that moment that just kind of keeps you on the edge of your seat, even with fairly mundane things happening. Along those same lines, because it's doing this reverse storytelling, it also keeps creating the scenario where everything that we see is reinterpreted every five minutes. We keep seeing something that we think it's one thing, and then we realize it's something totally different by the end of the scene. And it's the perfect blending of a character with a storytelling technique in a way that I haven't seen many movies do in such an interesting way. And this is one of the movies that made me love movies. I was able, lucky enough to be able to see this one in the theater when it first came out. And it truly made me go, wow, <laughs> it's, it's remarkable what you can do with movies. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to share your ranking down below in the comment section. There's a lot of great movies in here, so our lists are going to be really different. Let's have a nice, lively, but respectful conversation about this set of fantastic films. Also, remember, I did this video joining with the Autop stream. Be sure to check out their videos. Maybe you'll 
be introduced to some other creators, watch their videos, subscribe, like all of that fun stuff. The links are down below to their videos. In third place is The Dark Knight. This movie builds off the fantastic foundation laid in Batman Begins and just elevates everything to the next level. What Nolan did so wisely was instead of looking to the comic book movie genre to take inspiration for this film, he looked to the crime thriller genre as well as movies like A Clockwork Orange and drew inspiration from them and brought that into the comic book movie genre and created a film that transcends most films of the genre that it's in. And many of you would even declare it the greatest comic book movie of all time. Of course, you have a phenomenal performance from Heath Ledger as the Joker, but it works on a story level. It thematically builds towards a climax that's interesting where our lead character is challenged both by a threat that's trying to kill people, but as well challenging his belief system, all of it leading to that final little monologue about the Dark Knight that just ends on such a high note. Our runner up is Inception. One of the most mind-blowingly well-crafted movies of all time, where Christopher Nolan takes this fascinating concept about dreams and then combines it with the heist genre as well as the action genre, a little bit of the spy genre, and creates something awesome that in many ways we have truly never seen something like this before in films where some of these dream sequences look like Escher drawings turned into action sequences. All of it having this complex set of rules that you understand. Nolan wisely wrote the first hour of the film to be a set of exciting sequences, but during those sequences, it very slowly explains everything you need to know about the film. Certainly, as it starts telling five layers of story at five different paces at the same time, it gets complex, but it tells you everything you need to know to understand what's going on and what just takes this movie to the next level for me is that as you move into the final shot and its ambiguous ending, the movie's done the hard work to earn multiple interpretations of what it could mean. There's evidence of both kind of main interpretations of that final shot, and I love that about this film. This is, to me, Christopher Nolan's masterpiece. But coming in at number one is Pulp Fiction, a movie that breaks every storytelling rule that I normally judge movies by and somehow manages to make it work. It doesn't have any one clear main plot line. It has many different plot lines. Sequences can kind of drag on for a long time without a clear direction for where they're going, but they're absolutely mesmerizing. Quentin Tarantino manages to create this set of stories in this set of characters that just absolutely suck you in through these characters that pop and dialogue that snaps. And while there's not one big main storyline, it finds a way to tell each of these vignettes, these little stories that each of them have their own conflict that is fascinating and intriguing and you're invested in it even if the conflict is as simple as we need to clean the house because we're scared Bonnie is going to come home. And he has just such a gift for making the mundane so captivating and interesting. Therefore, because I love the movie, it's such an important movie, and for a thousand other reasons, it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, remember to check out all of the other 31 on 31s being done today by the members of the Ot Top stream. The links will be down below in the description. Maybe you'll link to some of them, as many of them as I can, right in here. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.